The, the motivation for uh, this talk is um, the problem of uh, sampling uniformly uh, from a convex body. Uh, from a convex body in uh, n dimensional space. Um, and um, I mean, this is a well studied problem with many um, interesting algorithms, and it led to some very nice conjectures and proofs and so on. Uh, but uh, just to state it uh, formally, um, the input to the computation of the algorithmic problem is you're given a point that is definitely in the interior of the body. And you're also, uh, you also have access to an oracle, um, which will answer queries of the form, does a given point belong to the body? And it will say yes or no. And you, you have the promise that it's a convex body. So uh, with this in mind, you'd like to have algorithms that don't ask too many queries, don't do too much other, other computation. In particular, everything should be polynomial in the dimension and be able to get arbitrarily close to the uh, uniform density. Okay, so I won't go over uh, history and so on. This is a short talk, but uh, the following algorithm was uh, proposed by, um, by Turchin in uh, 19... Oops, uh, 71. Um, and it's uh, very simple and it's, it's quite a bit more general. It, it doesn't, doesn't um, require convexity, the, the definition of the algorithm. So it says, uh, so in this setting, um, what it says is that at a current point X, you uh, pick one of the axis lines through X uniformly at random. So pick, uh, EI with uh, probability uh, one over n, and then um, because uh, you're in a in a in a set, in this case a convex uh, body, that will induce a chord, and on this chord, pick a uniform point. Pick a uniform point uh, on uh, uh, induced chord. And you go then, repeat this. So, so the next time maybe you pick a different axis and so on. Um, so it's clear that the support of this uh, Markov chain is the is the convex body, and uh, this is a quite a popular thing in practice because it's easy to implement and usually there is a standard basis. Um, uh, nevertheless. Um, uh, in spite of all the progress on this problem, this particular algorithm called coordinate hit and run or Gibbs sampling, because you're resampling one coordinate at a time, um, has been, um, uh, it's been open to analyze it. And uh, there was no polynomial time method known even, a polynomial time bound. That, 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 and so uh, somehow uh, about a year ago, uh, two different uh, papers proved it independently. So the one I will talk about is uh, joint work with uh, uh, Aditi Ladha, uh, a student here. Uh, and um, um, the uh, uh, independent work with a different proof, also of a polynomial bound, is by uh, Narayanan and Srivastava. Um, so th this is the, this, I, I hope the, the process is clear and the question is clear. Uh, we want to uh, understand how, at what rate does this uh, Markov chain appro approach its stationary distribution. It's clear that the stationary distribution is uniform because this is ergodic and symmetric and so on. So, okay. okay good. Uh, now, uh, to, to solve such general problems, with infinite spaces, we have, of course, uh, general tools. And uh, the tool that will be most uh, directly useful is uh, the notion of conducting, um, which, uh, for, which we define as follows. For a subset of our state space, which in this case is just the convex body, the conductance of a set is uh, simply the probability of leaving the set given that you're in the set. The probability that um, uh, uh, so so let me write it as integral over all uh, uh, x in S 
of probability going from X to the complement of S, okay, with respect to the uniform measure, which is uniform in this case, which is stationary measure, and divide by the smaller of um, the, the stationary measures of the two sides. So it's sort of the, the, the expansion of the Markov chain. You're asking, given that you're here, what's the probability of crossing over in one step? Um, and so general results of uh, 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 classical results as uh, formalized by Lovas and Shimonovitz uh, tell us that, uh, that the mixing rate can be directly related to the smallest such quantity. So if we define phi to be the infimum over all subsets of uh, phi s, then, uh, then uh, uh, for example, the, the, the chi-squared distance between the distribution after t steps and the target falls off um, uh, compared to the initial distance, falls off exponentially with the reciprocal of this conductance spread. So, so the mixing rate is one over phi squared. Okay, so that's good. Now, and then you get other, other notions also. So for example, if you knew that uh, what's sometimes called the warmness of a starting distribution, so the supremum of Q0 of S divided by Q of S over all subsets. Okay, if you, if, if you knew, if you had a bound on this, then uh, you, can, you, can, you can also bound, say, for example, the total variation distance between the T-step distribution and the start falls off as this n times one minus pi squared over two to the t. Okay, uh, we will need a slightly more general notion, which uh, is, uh, I figure it's coming a, a bit too early, so I will try to. Uh, okay, we will need a more general notion, which is um, uh, uh, that we. Uh, in this analysis, we'll not be able to bound the conductance of every set. In particular, very small sets will be difficult to bound. And so we'll have to uh, uh, only deal with larger sets. Uh, fortunately, a, 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 a companion theorem of Lovas and Jonovitz developed in their paper tells us that it's sufficient to conduct, consider what they call S conductance, where S is now a small s is a, is a number between uh, uh, zero and half. And, uh, uh, and and this is just basically the conductance of subsets of measure at least s. But the way they 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 define it is um, the infimum over all um, uh, uh, subsets where the Q of s is at least s, right? And and uh, of, of of the conductor. So so that that that's one way we can define it. Uh, I will write the whole expression here and. Now, what is the consequence? The consequence is that we may not, we will not get convergence so nicely, but we would, we do get convergence uh, in in the following sense. So this this figure is sort of a teaser. I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, well, okay. let me not try to worry about removing it. So phi s is the conductance of sets of measure at least small s, and using this, we can get the following bound. Um, Suppose we start off with a distribution, which is, uh, uh, which has, uh, again, let's say, uh, warmness M. So this is the supremum of uh, the starting distribution over all subsets compared to this target. Then um, uh, what we can guarantee is that the total variation distance between QT and Q will fall off as, uh, for any epsilon, uh, oh, sorry, for, since we have S here, we'll use S. Uh, um, uh, S times M plus M times one minus phi S squared over two. So th this is the same as before, as we you get with usual conductance. But here we have this additive term, uh, which is proportional to the, to the lower bound on the set side. And this is sort of unavoidable because those small sets, as far as we know, could have really poor conductance. So in particular, if you go there, you might get stuck and never get out. So it's unavoidable. But you know, we can, if we, if, we, if we want to target total variation distance less than some epsilon, 
we simply set S to be um, epsilon over two N. So you want to prove good conductance of all sets of at least this measure and uh, set T to be uh, uh, two over phi S squared times the log of um, uh, you know, two M over epsilon. So that way, both terms are less than epsilon over two and the whole the total variation distance will be less than epsilon. So this is a quite a useful tool, even though formally it doesn't prove the conductance of every sum. This would be what we want to do. Now, let's get to the, this is very general, applies to any Markov chain. What's happening here? The challenge, the, the usual way to prove or, or what has been followed to prove conductance is you take some subset and you argue that in the next step, you, you, will, you will step out. How do you do this? Well, what you say is if I take two points X and Y, then if they are far apart, uh, then I'm, I'm sorry, if they, if they are nearby, then in the next step, it's likely that, that they will, they will, their one step distributions, whatever they, wherever they go, will overlap. And this corresponds to crossing over a boundary. And if they are far apart, what if the sets are far apart? Well, if, the, if, the, if these sets are far apart, the ones that do not cross over, then what's left in the middle must be large. And this is a purely geometric inequality, isoperimetry. And therefore, there are lots of points, you know, which, which in fact have a good probability of crossing over your set of points. That's the general. The trouble here, of course, is that we're moving only along these one dimensional things at each step, right? We're only moving along the axis. So even if two points are really, really close, in any reasonable notion of distance, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that they, their one step distribution will overlap. In fact, the overlap will be zero. So how do, how do we, you can't push through the, the, the standard argument. Okay, so let me tell you uh, 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 what we will prove and then go about it. So the theorem we'll prove is that the, uh, the S conductance of, uh, of, of for coordinated and run for this, for this uh, Markov chain, is in fact at least a one over a polynomial in, in the dimension. Um, the, the, let's assume that the convex body contains a unit ball and is contained in a ball of radius capital R, or most of it. It's in fact enough for most of it to be contained in a ball of capital, capital R, R, and it's it will be linear in S. This is what we'll do. And this will imply a mixing time of um, I mean, in order to reach epsilon, this implies that uh, time, uh, uh, number of steps to reach uh, a TV distance less than epsilon will be uh, uh, bounded by order of um, uh, uh, poly nr and uh, divided by epsilon squared and with a log term logarithm of in, uh, also n squared, the warmness, log of 2n over epsilon. This will just using the low astronomers theorem. Okay, so uh, how, how do we do this? Okay, so let's let's look at what we can do. We, we still I still want to reduce the question of conductance to isoperimetry. I just can't use the standard thing. But to do this, let's look at a particular subset. Say I say this one. Now, uh, what? Let's let me separate in this subset. So this is this is S one, and let and let's say its complement is S two. Now, um, I want to isolate the parts which are unlikely to step apart. So let me define as S one prime the set of points in S one where the probability of stepping across is less than say one over two n. Okay. So uh, uh, these points might be somewhere, uh, uh, you know, some, for some reason they might they would, you would expect them to be deeper inside. And similarly over here, uh, maybe they're 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 somewhere there. Okay. So this is S one prime, and this is S two prime. So S two prime similarly is probably a second. Now here is the here is a simple uh, lemma about about S one prime and S two prime or observation that S one prime and S two prime are Axis disjoint. Okay. In other words, uh, for any point x in S one prime, if I draw an axis line through it in any direction, I will not hit a point in S two. 
this is a two line proof. Uh, 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 in fact, let me write down one of those lines. The probability going from such a point X in S1 prime to S2, just even stepping across, is at least, well, imagine that if there were in fact, there was a point X in S1 prime, that is, that, that's, that's going to S2 prime, then the probability will be at least one over N, and so to some point Y, times the length of this chord to X and Y intersected with S2, because then you're stepping into S2, divided by the length of the chord. And Y one over N, because I have to pick this axis, right, whichever axis they're on. And you get the same thing for the other one too, P X, uh, P Y S1. So when you add them up, you get uh, 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 the, the length of XY because you know these are these are the only things S1 and S2 cover the whole set. But we know that the probabilities are less than one over two n, which but if these two add up to one over n, one of them is multiplied than one over two n. It's a simple uh, contradiction. All right, so so now we have an isoperimetric statement. Let's ignore that one also. And the isoperimetric statement says the following. Uh, okay, question. The I have a convex body, which I have divided into two subsets, S1, I, uh, not, not, sorry, not divided. There are two disjoint subsets of, of, uh, of, of this convex body. And they are axis disjoint, which should be clear what they mean, right? Any two points, one in one set and one in the other set, uh, uh, do not have any axis line going through them. So there's no, it cannot be that they agree on only one chord. Okay. So under this assumption, we want to know, so let me draw an example. Here is S1, maybe here is S2, and you can see that they don't meet on any axis line. And the rest of it we'll call S3. And I want to know how large is volume of S3. Okay, so that's the basic question. You have two axis disjoint subsets, which don't have to be contiguous. I mean, they're just arbitrary subsets, measurable subsets. How, what is the measure of what's left? That's the question. Okay, so ju just to be completely precise, by axis disjoint, I just mean that the um, the the number of coordinates i in which x i equals y i, right, uh, must be less than n minus two, right? So that they cannot agree on uh, on 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, that's the they must agree disagree on at least two coordinates, right? Okay, so we. Now, classically, we would normally write you know, uh, volume of S3 is at least minimum of volume of S1, S2 times some distance, some notion of distance times between S1, S2. But here in this setting, you can see that the distance could be zero. I mean, you could essentially have a big get as close as possible to each other uh, 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 while being axis disjoint. Now, it still seems like we, we get some S3, right? There is S3 that, that's, that's untouched, how to, how to quantify it, okay? So the theorem that we'll end up proving, this is a pure geometric theorem now, is that the volume of S3 is at least um, uh, 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 we, we will need to use for any for any epsilon, uh, epsilon constant times epsilon over um, a polynomial. Unfortunately, this polynomial is like n to the 3.5 and r now times the minimum of uh, volume of S1 and volume of S2 minus epsilon times volume of K. So this is only interesting when, eps when, when, uh, when the volume of S1 is bigger than, bigger than uh, epsilon times volume of K. So for all large enough subsets, you get this, uh, this uh, uh, lower bound on the, on the isoperimetric. Okay. So for very small subsets, it tastes nothing. Um, uh, I, as far as I can tell, the so conjecture here would be that the, the right uh, constant here, so this, if I call this psi, this isoperimetric ratio, should, first of all, there should be no epsilon, and uh, it should be something like one over, or constant over square root n times r. That's the best possible. This is a simple example that you can show. If you just take a cylinder and tilt it, uh, and you set this up to be about R and this to be a unit ball, you'll see that this is the best you can have. Uh, uh, but uh, you, you, our bound is, of course, far from this. Now, in the remaining uh, uh, five minutes, uh, what I will try to show you 
is a particular special case of this, uh, which is a, a cube. Suppose the convex set is a cube. It's still a non-trivial statement. So the convex set K is just the cube 0, 1 to the n, but the subset is arbitrary, right? So S1 and S2 are arbitrary. Um, so in this case, this isoperimetric ratio will not have any epsilon, thankfully, but uh, for, so for cubes, we'll be able to show that this is at least ln2 over n, okay? And, and, and I'll show the proof in a second. Uh, even here, this is not tight. As far as I know, for a cube, the answer should be just a constant, uh, uh, independent of n. Uh, this, 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 you know, if you have two axis disjoint subsets of a cube, the rest of the mass must be at least a constant fraction of the cube. But I don't know how to prove it. I only know it with the one over n. Now, the one over n proof, I can give you a very direct, simple proof that it's one over n log n. And that's the following. I don't even have to write anything. If I were to run coordinate hit and run, what is it doing? It's resampling the, you know, it's picking a random EI and resampling. You only need to do that once per coordinate before you're completely mixed. So the mixing time is order n log n, because it takes only n log n twice before you're fully mixed. Okay, great. But the conductance, we know that the mixing time must be at least one over the conductance. And therefore, conduct, the conductance in this case is at least one over n log n. It's a little bit worse than what I promised you. But you see that up to the factor of n, it's easy. Now, how do we get uh, one, uh, L, uh, this ln2 over n? Um, let me just uh, show you that in the three minutes. Um, so to get ln2 over n, do the following. You take S1, all right, uh, however, however you have it. And uh, let me define the projection of this set, uh, uh, S1, for each coordinate. So this is just the projection orthogonal to EI, okay? So there are n, uh, n of them. And then once I have such a projection, I can also define the set epsilon I, which is just uh, basically take the projection and extend it to full dimension by just putting in the entire interval. So in other words, it's the extension in the, in, of, of S1 in the, in the EI direction. Okay, great. Now, because the sets are axis disjoint, we immediately get that for any epsilon i, the, the epsilon i uh, does not intersect S2, epsilon i of S1, right? I mean, this extension must lie completely in S1 or in S3. It cannot intersect S2 by definition. Therefore, uh, volume of S1 plus volume of S3 must be bigger than any one epsilon i volume. Now, this is true for each i. Let's add it up over all i's. And we get n times this plus n times this is greater than equal to n times this. Uh, um, so, so now I'm going to get my bound on volume of S3, which is what I want, is at least this volume of this, uh, not n here, sorry, this is the summation. They are not necessarily equal. Uh, 1 over n times the summation of volume of epsilon i minus volume of S1. Great. Now, uh, volume of epsilon i is the same as the n minus 1 dimensional volume of pi i. So this is 1 over n times summation of volume n minus 1 of pi, because I just extended by the, by the unit interval. Great. Now, uh, let us use the, the, the uh, you know, just arithmetic geometric inequality on the first part. So I get product of volume n minus one of these projections uh, to the power one over n minus volume of S1. Now, of course, you recognize this as uh, one side of the favorite special case of uh, a favorite inequality. So uh, Loomis, Whitney, and Brask and Lieb. So this will be at least um, uh, volume uh, n of uh, the entire set S1 to the power of n minus one over n minus volume of S1. And this is now if I pull out volume of S1, this is one over volume of S1 to the one over n minus one. And let's take S1 to be the smaller set. So volume of S1 
is smaller than volume of S2. So it's less than half in particular. And therefore, this is at least uh, uh, 2 to the 1 over n minus 1, which is uh, ln 2 over n times volume. So that's the case of the cube. It's a proof that uses uh, some of our, one of our favorite inequalities, but it's not the right answer as far as I know. I will stop here and I'm happy to take questions. And, yeah. We use this crucially in the proof for general convective, that, that the proof that we have now, which also I believe is not uh, anywhere near optimal. Okay, let's thank our speaker.